Thank you so much, Wendy, for being with us today. Mm -hmm. um, would you tell me where you're from and a little bit about your background? So I am Wendy Pineda from Houston, Texas, and um, <clears throat> I got my start in everything that's kind of like money, bank, financial, and everything related at Iglesia Episcopal San Mateo. I started working there when I was about 15 or 16 years old, and I worked with um, La Señora Laura Montes, and she really had such an attention to detail for everything that we did in financial statements that that's where I realized how important they were. And that's how I realized how important it was, you know, at month end to know everything that you spent that you didn't spend at year end, everything that you spent and you didn't spend and how every receipt is important. Um, every income is important. And so that's how, that's how everything got started for me. I think um, the three most important things about personal finances is first to know what your monthly income is. Um, we have to know how much monthly income we're bringing in and then what your monthly expenses are. Um, I think we live in such a world where we have credit cards and we think that that's money that we never have to pay back or we don't understand that there's interest that goes along with that. And so I think it's super important to understand that if you have $100 a month, you cannot be spending 110 It has to be less than that. Like, and so I think you definitely first need to know how much money you're bringing in and then how much money you're spending. Now, if your expenses happen to be higher than your income, you either have to find like a second job or find a way to cut those expenses. That I think that's very, very important. And then um, third, look at your debts. Um, I, I think a lot of us don't, don't remember when we have maybe like a recurring payment or something set up and it just comes off. And so just to look at, look at what our debt is, whether it's, um, credit cards or student debt or medical bills or any of that, I think that keeping, keeping that, those three things in mind are very important. And how could we translate this into a healthy uh, church finance? So I think with any church or any business, one of the things that we do, again, in the society, I think we do this as a whole, is that we throw a lot of things away. We don't take inventory of the things that we own. And so it could be as simple as I need black shoes. And instead of organizing my things, looking through my closet and finding my black shoes that I already have, I go to the store and I buy a new pair. And so you make a lot of expenses in a church, I think you do the same thing, that you make a lot of expenses that you don't um, need. And so, for instance, sometimes we have a list of people that are our vendors, and we never check that list again. So we don't know why we started using this vendor or why we're paying somebody something. And we just kind of keep making that same payment, same payment, same payment, until a third party comes in and they're like, well, what's this payment for? And then that's when you realize, oh, I don't really know. It's just they did it, so I'm doing it too. And so I think um, it's important for, for a church to see where, where the money is going. Um, and I think that's what makes healthy finances is that it's not just about, you know, like having enough money in the bank to pay it. It's actually taking the time to see where it's going. Sometimes with the um, I guess like when technology gets better, you can find a vendor that might do something less ex like less expensive, but we don't take the time to look for that or to look at that. And so I think if we have somebody that that's, that that's something that they're willing to do or that that's something that's part of their job, that if they can just, and it doesn't have to be every month, just once a year, look over that list of their vendors, look, look to see where everything is going, then that, that's part of healthy finances. Um, and then again, taking stock of your inventory of what you have, what you don't have. We don't have to throw everything away. Some things can be repaired and it's cheaper to repair something. And so just to not always have to buy something. Um, I think we do that a, a lot um, because it's just easy to throw it away instead of cleaning it up. So I think, I think part of having healthy finances is that it's organizing, you know, your home or your church and then seeing what you have. And then when you need to go out and buy something, just really 
making sure if it's a need or if it's just like you don't want to look for what you already own. If you have an administrator at your church, that's something that an administrator can do because the administrator is looking or someone that's working in the accounting department, somebody that's looking at that stuff already. Um, that's something that can be added to their job. Um, or maybe it's already in their job description and no one explained it to them or nobody has asked, like, hey, did you do this already? A lot of churches, especially if they're smaller, I don't think that you need to bring an outside person in because it does get expensive. But um, for the most part, you can find um, you can find people that are willing to do it pro bono, or you can find um, organizations that will set that will link you or connect you to someone that's willing to do it pro bono. And so that's something that you might want to look at, um, or. If you have people that go to your church that happen to work in finances or happen to work in accounting or that are CPAs or that are heading in that direction, that's something that if they're willing to give some volunteer time, that'll look really great on the resume, you know, just something like that or putting them in like a board of directors seat, something something that you can, um, that they can help you and then you can help them. I think that would be very beneficial because it's that expertise that really helps and having that that outside pair of eyes where you normally don't know where to look and they do this all the time so they know exactly what they're looking for. So I think that would probably be the best thing. And the thing is that we have a lot of people in our church that are really smart, that know what to do. It's just that um, we we don't ask a lot of the times or or we or we give like a general invitation when instead we can go, Sandra, would you mind doing this? And then it's, it, it makes the invitation a lot different because it is to me and it's not just to the sea of people that are here. The biggest financial mistake that churches make, I'll start with that, is that anybody can sign a check, that they don't just keep up with who's signing and that, and that sometimes like the the priest is signing a check and it doesn't require a second signature, I think that can get into murky waters, not because the priest or the clergy are bad people. It's just that you always want to have a second pair of eyes. And it's very easy to point blame at the person that's always there. And, and we hear about it all the time where um, the person in charge stole money or something like that. So, so I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that if um, I guess like your handbook or your rules say that after a certain amount of money, you need two signatures. I think it's important that you follow that and it's going to be different for every different church. Um, but I think it's very important that you pay attention to who's signing checks. Um, if you have like credit cards or debit cards for the church, you pay attention to who's handling it, what's the limit that people are allowed to use without requiring like a second signature, any of that stuff. I think that's very, very important. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make. Um, personally, the biggest mistake that I think we make with our finances is we take on more credit than we should because the credit card wants you to take on the credit. And so they're going to send you like, hey, I see that you're reaching your limit. Do you want to increase that? And you're just like, yes, please. And guess what happens? A month later, you top that limit again. It's, um, and so I think it's very important that we understand if we're at our limit and we can't pay that down, probably means that we shouldn't increase it anymore. You know, so that's, that's something that I think it's it's really important. Um, and that it's one of the mistakes that we as individuals that we make. Any other tips? Or don't don't put them in your bedpost. Don't put money in the bedpost. Just take it to the bank. <laughs> I think the biggest tip is that it's not scary. I think a lot of people don't want to check their bank accounts. You know, like it's not scary. It's a number. And once you see it, once you see whether it's positive or negative, where it's more than you thought, less than you thought, you can then fix the problem. But as long as you have like your head in the sand, it's only going to multiply. And, and there's like apps, there's books, there's people out there that are happy and willing to help. But you have to be able to see what the problem is, if there is a problem. 
because you might have tons of money laying around and you don't know it. And so um, it's important, like if it's important to open your mail and check your bills. Um, Cause I know that we don't do that and we have a lot of things come in electronically, but instead of opening the email, we just delete it cause we just assume it's a bill. So I mean, it's important to like not be scared to look at what's coming in and out of your bank account cause it's your money and it's gonna matter only to you. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.